During the Cold War, Boeing developed plans to load a 747 with as many as 72 air-launched cruise missiles to serve as a sort of long-range arsenal ship that could wipe out targets from hundreds of miles away. This design, dubbed the 747 CMCA, really had some practical value at the time, and to be honest, it might still today. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Normally, I would dive right into the story, but first, I'm going to take a quick second to ask you to like and subscribe. I'm sorry, I know it's kind of annoying, it's just one of those things you're supposed to do on YouTube. Now let's get back to the CMCA, because back on June 30th, 1977, President Jimmy Carter announced that he was canceling development on America's B-1 bomber. He cited the program's cost overruns and advancing ballistic missile technology for his decision seeing bombers as just less important than they once were. Of course, that bomber would eventually find new life under the Reagan administration and would result in the B-1B Lancer that remains in service to this day. Northrop Grumman's B-2 Spirit, sometimes referred to as America's stealth bomber, also entered service in the 80s, placing America's strategic bomber capabilities right back up at the top of the global military heap. But for a short window of time, the U.S. really seemed to be in need of a heavy payload aircraft that had enough endurance to cross entire oceans to engage enemy targets. And from an economic standpoint, the easiest way to do that would be to convert an existing commercial platform to carry the recently developed AGM-86 air-launched cruise missiles. And what better commercial platform than the world's first jumbo jet, the Boeing 747? This wasn't the first time the 747 was considered for military duty. It was actually designed to compete for an Air Force cargo and transport contract, which it ultimately lost to Lockheed C-5 Galaxy. It didn't have to sweat that loss for long because it soon found renewed purpose as a commercial airliner and was the largest civilian aircraft in the world at the time. The original 747 fuselage stretched 225 feet and carried a vertical tail that stood as tall as a six-story building. It had more square footage in its wings alone than you can find in an entire basketball court, and just one of the 747's wings was 30 times heavier than Boeing's entire first aircraft, which was launched just 53 years earlier. Boeing designed the 747 incredibly quickly, in under 16 months by their own accounting, but the effort was still absolutely monumental. 50,000 employees had a hand in the 747 program. More than 75,000 engineering drawings were produced, accounting for some 6 million parts and over 171 miles of wiring. In order to ensure the aircraft design was as efficient as they wanted it to be, it spent more than 15,000 hours in the wind tunnel, and then another 1,500 hours in flight testing. Incredible as the 747 really was, however, it was also a real gamble. Boeing had struggled to finance the completion of its development, eventually borrowing more than $2 billion dollars, which is almost $15 billion in today's money, just to get it across the finish line. If it had failed to find a market, it would have literally meant the end for Boeing. And it may have been with that in mind that plans for the 747 CMCA began to form. Boeing knew the Air Force might be interested in an aircraft that could carry almost 77,000 pounds with a range of nearly 6,000 miles, so they set to work on just such a proposal in 1980. If they were successful, it would mean selling their expensive new design in both commercial and military markets, for cargo, personnel, and also as an arsenal ship. Their new design began with a 747-200C, which was a convertible airliner with a nose cargo door that could be opened to remove the seats and leave the interior empty, as well as to bring on large payloads. The 747 cruise missile carrier aircraft would leverage the new AGM-86 air-launched cruise missile, 
which was designed specifically to increase the survivability of launching aircraft by engaging targets at ranges that could exceed 1,500 miles, which was well outside the reach of the Soviet surface-to-air missiles of the day. But while the B-52 could carry 20 of these 21-foot-long cruise missiles, the 747 CMCA could carry 72 of them. In order to accomplish that incredible feat, the weapons would be carried within the 747's fuselage on nine rotary launchers, each loaded with eight AGM-86 cruise missiles. The missiles would be fired one at a time from a side door near the rear of the aircraft, with each rotary launcher sliding back into firing position as it was needed. Now, it may have fired those missiles one at a time, but Boeing's design was meant to launch them in incredibly quick succession. And the missiles themselves would leverage a satellite data link to receive target information while the 747 was already in the air. Alternatively, target information could be relayed to the missiles from a command and control team stationed just behind the cockpit of the aircraft, in the area that is usually reserved for first-class passengers. As a result, the 747 CMCA would have been able to deploy more cruise missiles than three B-52s combined, each with independent targets within hundreds of miles of one another. But impressive as that may be, it was the potential cost savings that made a missile-packing 747 seem like a very viable option. Now, I know the concept sounds crazy, but the 747 CMCA would have actually been way cheaper than any of America's existing or future bombers. The B-1B Lancer that would eventually eliminate our need for the 747 CMCA can carry a comparable payload at around 77,000 pounds, but its afterburning turbofan engines also make it extremely fast which along with its sweep wing design makes it very maneuverable, especially for a bomber carrying so much ordnance that you could literally measure it in school buses. But it's also incredibly expensive at around $61,000 per hour to fly. The B-52 is older and even pricier at about $70,000 per hour, and the stealthy B-2 Spirit crushes those figures, with a jaw-dropping $130,159 per hour. Meanwhile, a modern 747 rings in at just twenty-five dollars an hour. A large part of what makes America's bombers so pricey to operate is the size of our respective fleets. The Air Force operates about 62 B-1Bs, 76 B-52s, and just 20 B-2 Spirits. With so few of these planes in existence, parts tend to be very pricey, and they keep getting pricier as all three of these bombers continue to age. Conversely, more than 1,500 747s have been built, with supply lines and maintenance infrastructure already established all over the world. That means it's just plain cheaper to get parts to 747s and get them into the aircraft. As Tyler Ogaway pointed out way back in 2014, a 747 carrying 72 cruise missiles would have been extremely handy over Afghanistan throughout the past 20 years of conflict. With its low operating cost, great endurance, and massive payload, the 747 CMCA could have been an air support powerhouse in the uncontested airspace over Afghanistan, as well as in other conflict-ridden areas like Iraq and Syria. If the aircraft had been put into service and converted to carry JDAMs of varying sizes, along with small diameter bombs over the years, the number of individual targets it could engage increases from 72 to practically hundreds, and all at a fraction of the cost of America's current bomber options. Today, both the B-1B Lancer and the B-2 Spirit are slated to retire in favor of America's forthcoming stealth bomber, the B-21 Raider. The B-21 promises to offer incredibly advanced stealth technology and the same global strike capabilities we've come to expect from bombers like the Raider's predecessor, the B-2. There is a significant catch, however. The B-21 Raider is going to be quite a bit smaller than the B-2, limiting its payload capabilities to around 30,000 pounds. That's not terribly far off from the B-2's 40,000-pound limit, 
but it's less than half of the supersonic B-1B's 75,000 pound capacity. While the B-21 will likely be more economical than the B-2 thanks to newer technology and fresher airframes, there's really no denying that operating stealth aircraft is expensive. I mean, that's really why the Air Force opted to buy new non-stealth F-15EXs, which offer nearly three times the lifespan at less than half the cost per operating hour than the F-35. Right now, we just straight up don't know how much the B-21's going to cost to operate, but you can bet it'll be more than $25,000 per hour. Of course, the U.S. is no longer conducting combat operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, but as the U.S. and its competitors continue to lean into a new era of great power competition, it seems unlikely that America's days of conducting combat operations in uncontested airspace are over. Just like the last Cold War, the simmering tensions between the U.S. and China are kind of unlikely to boil over into open war anytime soon. Not just because of the same old mutually assured destruction, but also because of the promise of economic catastrophe. Our economies are just too intricately intertwined with one another and the worlds at large for declaring war to be a good idea for anyone. But that doesn't mean we're all going to get along. What it really means is that America and China will likely compete in proxy conflicts in the developing world, as each nation jockeys for diplomatic leverage and resources and strategic footholds around the globe. Avoiding war is obviously not a sure thing, but the Cold War model, for all its failings, did manage to stave off the nuclear apocalypse. With America's special operations forces spread apart further than ever before, supporting ally and partner forces all over the planet, America has a growing need for economical air support in the developing world. SOCOM's armed Overwatch program is aiming to meet that need, but a fleet of converted commercial arsenal ships could prove invaluable for that and similar mission sets. The biggest challenge in supporting disparate operations spread over a massive landmass like Africa is the tyranny of distance. Cheap 747s converted to carry long-range cruise missiles and shorter-range munitions alike already have the endurance needed for continent-spanning missions, and that range could be extended further through in-flight refueling. In other words, in the 21st century, a 747 filled to the brim with bombs and missiles could well be the king of the new battlefield. The last production 747s are slated for delivery next year, but the effort could be even lower cost if the U.S. were to procure used airframes for the job. Or a newer commercial aircraft could also fit the bill. It is perhaps a crazy idea for even crazier times, and of course it wouldn't replace America's need for strategic bombers, but a 747 or similar cruise missile carrier aircraft could feasibly become the infantryman's best friend on far-flung battlefields in the years to come. And with that sort of bonkers postulation ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news and entertainment from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below, and don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.